My name's Paul Stack, as I said. I'm Stack72 on Twitter. I'm very happy to be back at Dev Day. Um, I really thoroughly enjoyed it last year. It's quite nice to be in a situation where I can give a talk this year and I'm not drunk, which is fantastic. So I, w I will actually be in a really good state to answer some questions. Um, and this is my session uh, called What is DevOps and how can it help my business succeed? Now, it's a very fluffy title, so I thought I'd add a second fluffy title or how empathy is the key to making great products. <laughs> yes! <laughs> Fluffiness part two. Um, okay, so we're gonna go over a few things today, but the first thing is we're actually going to talk about what DevOps is. Now, we'll have well, a quick history lesson. This is what we would class as the history of the term DevOps. The concept and of, of uh, the agility of being able to perform uh, in infrastructure and systems has been around for a long, long time, but this is a formalized process. So, 2007, Belgium, okay? Nothing really much happens in Belgium. Any Belgian people in? No, okay, I can, I can actually insult people. Um, so, Belgium, great for two things, beer and chocolate. Nothing else, sorry? Fries. fries. I don't know. I've never tried Belgian fries, so I can't comment. That's a very... Uh, Rob, you lived in Belgium. Is it good? Fries. Yeah. yeah they They're okay. Fries. So They invented them. Why do you think I'm so fat that's about here? Because uh, you drink a lot. <laughs> uh, so anyway, 2007 in Belgium, a gentleman called Patrick Dubois. Anyone heard of Patrick Dubois? Excellent. So I could be making all this up and nobody will help. Uh, so Patrick is an IT professional whose goal was to learn IT from every possible angle. Now that means development, QA, IT operations, uh, business analysts, all sorts. Okay? And he, he used to go from each and every department in order to experience the full organization structure. So the, in 2007, he took on a project for the government in Belgium to migrate a data center. Okay. Anybody been involved in a data center migration? It sucks. It's the hardest thing ever because you just know that when you plan your maintenance and you come up at six o'clock in the morning and everything's supposed to work before the start of your business day, it doesn't. So Patrick was actually in charge of the testing. Okay? He was the middleman. He was the guy who was really key between the, uh, the operations team and the development team. And he really found friction. He knew there had to be a better way. Okay. And he started researching better ways. Fast forward to Agile Conference in 2008 in Canada, and you had a gentleman called Andrew Schaefer. And he actually proposed a session, uh, it, it's called a birds of a feather session, uh, on Agile infrastructure. Okay. Now one person showed up to that session. Does anybody want to hazard a guess of who that person was? Patrick Dubois. Okay. Now when I say one person turned up to that session, I do mean one person turned up to that session. The speaker didn't turn up to that session because he had had such bad feedback on the session abstract that he, did, he thought it would be useless. He thought it would be really bad. So Patrick was very disappointed, obviously. And at the end, uh, he decided that he would go and try and find Andrew and try and discuss the, some of the concepts that he thought about. And they found each other in the hall and they, and they, they really started to push further. Now, we go forward again one more year, and they're still discussing a lot of stuff. And then the first Velocity Conference happens in 2009. Okay? And one of the instrumental talks in the continuous delivery world was given at that conference uh, by Paul Hammond and John Allspaw. Now, John Allspaw is now, he's at Etsy. I don't actually know his official job title. And back then, uh, they were both at Flickr. Okay? And they, the talk was called 10 plus deploys a day at Flickr. Now this was a huge concept. Back in 2009, it was known that some people were moving very fast in industry and being able to be very agile, but there was no formalized process for it. And this was the talk that had the first formalized process. Now, Paul was talking about the engineering side and John was talking about the operations side. And the conference was live streamed and Patrick was actually watching the conference in Belgium. So, they started, he started going to uh, Twitter and started talking about how this was a really good, you know, a, a really good move in the IT world and, and, and things should really go that way and that why was that conference in America, you know, we should have our own uh, in Europe. And uh, a guy called Paul Nazareth, who was at, up until recently, I don't actually know if he's still there or not now, he was a site reliability engineer at Google, 
they started having a Twitter discussion, and they joked about making a Velocity conference in, uh, in Europe. Has anybody heard of Velocity, a Velocity conference? Okay, so it's like a web operations and performance conference. It's got different tracks for UI and front end and uh, performance and security and stuff like that. So it, it, it solidifies a lot of concepts under one conference. So they decided to set up a conference in October 30, uh, 30th and 31st in 2009 in uh, Ghent in Belgium. Okay, the conference was for developers and system admins, or as we call them, ops, for two days, which equaled the name DevOps Days. Now, they continued discussing this on Twitter for quite a while, and it was a, a phenomenal success. Okay, so you had people come from all over the world. You had people flying from Australia, people flying from USA, uh, other people traveling from uh, the UK and other countries in Europe who, to come and attend this. Like some very well-known people in the agile world, really, really well-known people. And um, it was a complete success. Like JaegerConf, it was a complete success. Now, conferences have soon popped up all over the world for Dev Day. Okay, I promise I'm not going to continue with the fluffy stuff. We'll actually get into the real stuff soon. Um, conferences have popped up all over the world. So they've gone Sydney, Mountain View, India, Japan. Uh, I, I believe there has been one, uh, there's one this year in Brazil. That, so DevOps days is everywhere. And because of the way that Twitter works and having 140 characters, they didn't want to always hashtag DevOps days. So they dropped the days and they just hashtag DevOps. Okay. That is actually the official uh, uh, creation of the term DevOps, okay? There's no real amazing story behind it, apart from the fact that it was an evolution of ideas and came out of an event. So, out of DevOps days and uh, all this new thinking, lots of new tools have spawned up in the past few years, okay? <laughs> so we got Graphite and Jenkins and Sensu and Vagrant and Logstash and Chef and Puppet and all sorts, okay? Now, there's a ton of uh, other tools in there that you can actually use. So you've got Ansible, you've got SaltStack, you've got Terraform, you've got Packer. Anything that you can use in order to help do something effectively inside your IT organization now and do it the same way every time has all spawned from continuous integration, continuous delivery, DevOps, infrastructure management. So um, these new tools were a much better way of working. Okay, Firstly, People love shiny new toys. Does anybody not like a shiny new toy? We all love them, right? We love the new shiny languages. We love all these new th things that we think is gonna be very good for us. So people love these new tools. They really wanted to use these new tools in order to help them out. In 2011, a company called Gartner actually made a statement uh, Gartner is an, uh, an IT research and advisory firm in the US, and they actually said, by 2015, DevOps will evolve from a niche strategy employed by large cloud providers into a mainstream strategy employed by 20% of global 2000 organizations. Okay, now this was, as I say, in 2011. DevOps has moved really fast. It's 2014 now, and I'm standing here in Poland talking, preaching to some people about DevOps. Okay, this is, it's moved in a, a huge way. Okay, it escalated really fast. Now, DevOps, what is DevOps? DevOps is actually a huge umbrella term. Okay, it doesn't mean a specific thing. In its most basic format, it denotes anything that helps the collaboration and communication within the business. So developers, operations, QA, business people, marketing, et cetera, et cetera because all of these people are all part of the organization and are required for the organization to be successful. DevOps was from practitioners for practitioners. So it, was, it, it, it wasn't like 20 businessmen sitting in a, in a boardroom deciding, oh, what should we call this new thing? It was actually uh, people getting together and sharing stories on how to make their lives better. It's not a thing, it's not a product, not a job title. You would not hire a DevOps in the same way as you would not hire an Agile. It's a concept. It's a movement based on sharing experiences and most importantly, it's open to all. It's not exclusive. So what's the point? We used to have the traditional IT enterprise. Okay? You have development on one side who want to change things and you have operations on the other side who want stability. They always clashed because 
it was a silo. They never talked to each other. Does anybody, hands up, if in your, you just put your hand up. I'm, you're excited. <laughs> you're excited. Does anybody have uh, organizational silos? So are there any companies that have their development in one office and their operations in another office? Wow. Okay. It's 2014. Let's wake up. <laughs> um, does anybody outsource their development and outsource their operations to completely different com uh, companies? How difficult is that? It's very difficult, right? Does any teams in here actually have their operations and development sitting beside each other? Excellent. There is hope. There is hope. That's exactly what we want. So ops wanted to, to, to stabilize things. And they were very reluctant to change because of developers liking shiny new things and throwing new things into production all the time and causing outages. Okay. DevOps Borat, best Twitter account ever. Confuse of DevOps, simple rule. If you are praised for website success, you are dev. If you are blamed when website down, you are ops. <laughs> it's very, very true. Operations are the people that get the grief. They're the people that get woken up in the middle of the night. It's the way it works. What happens is devs create a package, a build package of some sort. They throw it over the wall, and the operations team actually deploy it. Anybody still working that way? A few people. Now, the trouble with this is that you're then leaving it to an operations team to deploy something that they, A, they haven't been involved in building and don't know how it works, and B, they have not really had any collaboration how infrastructure should be scaled or how things need to change in their monitoring and alerting to go with it. And this is a real common pain. The lack of communication or interaction means that operations are continually firefighting when this happens. And it does happen like this. It really does. We develop stuff on our local machines, and we build it, and we throw it across the water or across the wall, and we're really surprised when things do not work in production. Shocked, almost. Okay. So how does DevOps make a uh, help? Okay, so with DevOps, there is what's called the three ways. These are the underpinnings of what DevOps is about. Okay, one, systems thinking. Two, amplify feedback loops. And three, create a culture of continual experimentation and learning. Okay, very fluffy words. The first way, systems thinking. You have to think of this as the flow. Okay, the flow of, of uh, information from business to customer. So you're, some lovely people get together in a boardroom, they decide on a brand new feature for your website or your system that then comes down through the business analyst, again goes into the development team, it goes through QA, it goes through operations, it gets released to the customer. Okay, that's flow through your system. Okay? But in this case, development is classed as the business representative and operations is classed as the customer representative. Okay? Because the developers have to create the project and operations have to release it to the outside world. Now, notice that the flow is in one direction. Okay, I actually should have had one direction playing in the background there. That would actually have been quite funny. Um, so the flow is in one direction. And at that point, that is throwing something across the wall. Okay, getting operations to deploy it. An idea to, from, uh, from an idea to a, a system in production. Okay. Understanding the work, forget what devs want, what ops want, it's what the business wants. That's what this is about. It's about understanding why you have to build a product. Okay. So understand and work. Does any, anybody tell me the four types of work? There are four types of work that have been classified. No, everybody sleeping? Yeah. Just you don't know the names. Okay, so describe one to me. Yeah, you're close. You are very close. Okay, so there's business projects. Okay, so search. <laughs> search or UI improvement. Okay, there's internal projects. That's architecture changes, language updates, framework changes. There's actual real changes on a day-to-day -day basis, so schema updates, deployments. And then the last one, which is the killer, which is called unplanned work. 
Okay, and unplanned work is downtime, investigations, alerts, you know, firefighting as much as you can. The first way is about, so that flow from dev to ops is about understanding, uh, mastering the understanding of the different types of work and how the different types of work can affect making a commitment to the business. Who has to give estimates? Who was in the last session about saying no? Okay. One of the biggest things is when you make, a, when you make a, an estimate and you say, I've got four weeks worth of work, if you don't hit that deadline, then you firstly, why make deadlines? That's a different thing completely. But you're, you're basically creating an SLA between yourself, a commitment between yourself and the, the business in order to get something done. Now, unplanned work can really affect that because if you have a week of downtime, you've lost a week of development time or a, a week of operations time in order to get stuff out. So it's about understanding how you balance the types of work to be very focused and very um, successful in what you're doing. Any questions on the first way? Anybody care? Uh, oh, you do? Oh. But the last time you told me you would never get this hour of your life back. <laughs> um, the second way, amplifying feedback loops. So before we had left to right, now we have right to left. Okay, operations are actually starting to give feedback back to the developers. Sorry? It's not complaining, it's constructive feedback. <laughs> I like the idea of operations just complaining at developers, but that is not the case, mostly, <laughs> mostly. Okay, so providing feedback and visibility. Okay, now feedback is not getting off your desk, getting off your ass, walking over to the development team and saying, what the hell have you released that's caused all these problems? It's about giving them the visibility into the system so that they can understand what the problems are. Okay, metric systems, logging systems, dashboarding, deployment mechanisms that's much simpler, Hubot control scripts, etc., etc. Okay, it's no good collecting data unless you actually know what to do with that data. And we do collect data as companies. Who, use, who collects logs in their application? There's some people with their hands not up. Why are you not collecting logs in your application? <laughs> who actually looks at those logs? Not many people at all, right? Who would know by looking at their logs if there was a, pro apart from the fact that you can go from one log every hour to four million logs every hour, would you understand the flow of logs in your system to understand that there was a problem? A couple of people, excellent, excellent. I'll give you all that money I promised you earlier, a bit later, okay. Um, you have to know what's going on around you. You have to know how your system is performing. And the interaction between operations and development is hugely important for that, hugely important. Know about the types of data you need, make it visible. Don't just capture it in production. Cap do you capture those same logs in QA? Who captures logs in their QA environment? Ah, oh, seriously, you. Okay, so we're gonna forget about you six people and we're gonna concentrate on the rest. Okay, so why are the rest of you not? <laughs> just joking. Um, how did development relate, how do development activities relate to those metrics? So can you tell of an increase of response time in your application if a new deployment has happened? These are all really key things. Can you tell if by changing a pixel or moving your button from uh, position 1A to position 1B, how it affects conversion in your system? These are the types of feedback that we need to collect that data and to make it visible. Feedback is very important. So a guy called Patrick Lightbody, uh, CEO of Browser Mob, said that we found that when developers got woke up at 2 a.m., defects got fixed faster. <laughs> You'll only ever be woken up once before you think, I'm, not, I'm gonna fix that tomorrow. I'm not being woken up tomorrow night, no way. That's what happens. When it's operations job, you'll have a lovely, nice sleep and you'll come in the next morning refreshed and you'll see those guys with matchsticks holding their eyelids open because they've been working all night to try and understand what the hell has happened to the system. Developers need to take responsibility for some of the things they release into production. Hands up who gets woken up when their system goes down in the middle of the night. Wow. Any of you carry a pager, a real pager? Hey. So it's what? 
No one has a pager. Well, you've obviously evolved as a nation. Some people actually do carry pagers, real pagers. I don't know why they're horrible. We have phones. We have all sorts of applications for this now. There shouldn't be any need. Anyway, um, a company called Etsy, who are based in the US, actually have created a blog post around measuring how many times during the night their operation staff get woken up by alerts. Okay? Because they have on call, they have 24 hour on call, and they want to understand that, uh, they want to minimize disruptions for their, app, for their, their, their uh, staff during the night. Okay? That's taking things really seriously. That's amazing. That's really, really amazing. Okay. Any questions on the second way? No? You just want me to shut up and we'll all go for drinks? <laughs> thanks, thanks. Uh, so the third way, if you've, if you've managed to get feedback from development to operations and you've managed to get all your systems in place, so your dashboarding and, and your UIs in place and your alerting and your monitoring, then you can really start to change things. Okay? You can continually experiment in systems. Okay? Um, Etsy is a, a, a great example of this as well. They have like a thousand A-B tests running on their website excuse me, at any one time, okay? They like to be able to change little tiny pieces of the puzzle and understand how that affects everything. Now again, they can't do that unless they have the visibility into the metrics that they're collecting to understand what happens. It's no good changing the color of a button if it means that people stop pressing that button. It's really important. When we increase experimentation and learning, we see the following, okay? We will fail. And not only that, we will fail often. That's life. It's Murphy's Law. What can go wrong will go wrong. Best coined by an Irishman. We, in, we can inject faults into the production system as early as possible so that we can actually cut long-term damage. We push ourselves into the unknown more frequently and become comfortable with that, uh, with that unknown. We don't panic when we see problems in the system. We can react much faster because we have the metrics around it. We innovate and we iterate in a very controlled manner. Okay? Now, I didn't go to Ben's talk, but I, uh, I glanced the slides earlier. And um, a lot of the, the, the same way that design can change and, and uh, be iterated on is very similar to how you can iterate when, you, uh, when you're in a situation of the third way. Okay? You can take the experiments. You can start to look at active white space and start changing things around. See, I did read your slides. Are you impressed now? Um, so by changing, by, by, by trying to embrace all of these design techniques, you can really start to see how your system changes and put flexibility into it. Our code commits are much more reliable and production ready earlier. Okay. Anybody in here think they do continuous delivery? Does anybody in here do continuous integration? Okay, good, quite a few. Okay. Does anybody do continuous deployment? You guys are a bit more advanced than most people. <laughs> I understand that. Um, there's a great book on this stuff, okay? It's called The Phoenix Project. It, it, it's a rewrite of uh, Dr. Elliot Golrat's uh, book called The Goal. Okay? The Goal was written in the 80s, and it was about manufacturing plants and understanding flow. Okay? It has been rewritten by Gene Kim, Kevin, uh, Kevin Baer, and George Baffert. And it's about IT. It's about how collaboration in, in an IT environment and in an organization helps deliver more systems easily. Okay? Um, if you haven't read it, read it. Okay? Give it to your CEO. Give it to your CIO. Give it to your CTO. Show them that you want to help make the changes. Because if they see other people are interested in this stuff, then it's half the battle. It really is. It's a culture thing. Now, for me, there are four main companies that are doing this. Four main companies of when I wrote this talk, okay? I wrote this talk like four months ago. And the, my four favorite companies that get it are Etsy, Netflix, Amazon, and Facebook. There are many, 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 many others, smaller companies than these guys. It's just these guys are, are very large, okay? Amazon are huge, Facebook are huge, Netflix are very well known, and Etsy are what I would class as the pinnacle of operations, okay? They get it. They get the three ways. They have all these different pieces of the puzzle in place and they can experiment and change things. The best example of, of uh, the, the, being able to change your system on the fly is, uh, is the Facebook live chat system. Okay? So Facebook redeveloped their live chat. Okay? So 
What they did is that they wrote the code and they, they had a feature toggle in the system. Okay? They toggled the system on. All the private messages that you were sending to other people on Facebook were actually going through their live chat system. Okay? When they were happy that they could take all of that infrastructure and they could take all those messages, they actually toggled the UI on and at that point you could actually instant message each other. Okay? Because they were able to understand what was happening, they were able to measure everything and see the success or failure metrics. So what is DevOps? To make error as human, to propagate error to all server in an automatic way is DevOps. <laughs> Seriously, this Twitter account cracks me up. I absolutely love it, I really do. So what do I win, right? You know what DevOps is. Let's talk about what it's not. It's not a job role. I actually took this four months ago from Stack Overflow Careers for a DevOps lead, okay? If your company is hiring DevOps staff, they probably don't fully understand it. Now, I'm not saying that they're wrong. What I'm saying is, is that they're, they, they understand what they want to achieve, but they're putting a term in its way. Okay? They're actually trying to make it a physical team. What you're actually doing there is you're creating another silo. If you hire a DevOps team, and that DevOps team interacts with your, uh, your dev team and your ops team, you've gone from two silos to three silos. Interesting. Okay? It's definitely not a role. You wouldn't, as I said earlier, you wouldn't hire an Agile or a Scrum or a Lean. You would not hire a DevOps. This is why culture and people is much more important than, than tooling. DevOps is not about developers getting access to production. <laughs> that can and has been a car crash in the past. Even though I talk about this, I break things on a day-to-day -day basis. I really do. And it's because when you give people access and pseudo access, things change. You, you create unknowns in your system. When you create unknowns in your system, if a problem happens, you cannot replicate that that is the, that is the actual uh, thing that happened. It's not an exclusive club. You don't have to be bought in to be DevOps. You need to understand why it's a good thing for your company and you actually can help achieve that within your company. DevOps is about four things. Culture, automation, measurement, and sharing. This actually all, this sums up the three ways perfectly. Culture, people and processes are first. If you don't have culture, all automation attempts will be fruitless. Okay, if everybody is not bought into the automating of all your systems, then that tiny little part that you own, that you've automated, <coughs> fair play, great for automating it, but if no one else is actually bought into the same concept, then that's the only part of the system that's gonna be automated. It's about creating a culture that everybody wants to be in that automation. Automation itself, this is one of the places that you start once you actually get a better culture, okay? At this point, you can start to have the tools to stitch together the automation fabric. There are so many tools out there that can actually help you get from code to production, spinning up boxes, managing boxes, uh, interacting with AWS, interacting with DigitalOcean, interacting with cloud providers in general. Okay, really starting to get your systems uh, at the point of which you can take your entire system down and spin it back up within minutes. Okay. So, at this point, a quick question. Hands up if it would take you more than six months to rebuild your pr entire production infrastructure if you had a major catastrophe in your data center. What do you mean by major catastrophe? Okay, so Mar Martin, Fowler, Martin Fowler has actually said he would love to be able to go into a data center with a, a chainsaw, a water pistol, and a sledgehammer and actually destroy your production infrastructure, completely destroy it. How long, how many companies would it take more than six months to bring up again? A couple, okay. How long would it take more than a month to bring back up? How long would it take more than a week to bring back up? The, hands up who doesn't have a production infrastructure. <laughs> um, is there anybody that can spin up their environment on demand? There's a few people. There are a few people. Okay. When you can spin up your environment on demand, you can start to take calculated risks. You can deploy code just before you get on a plane, <laughs> break master, and then push that out to your uh, clients, and then hopefully things don't break. 
Tools for release management, provisioning, configuration management, systems integration, monitoring, orchestration, they're all parts of this automation fabric for your environment. They all have to come together. Okay. Measurement. If you can't measure, you can't improve. I keep hitting my head off this. A successful cult DevOps culture will measure everything it can as often as it can. Performance metrics, process metrics, people metrics, how long it takes people to, uh, to deliver features. How can you make that more efficient? How can you cut out the rubbish, no offense, uh, from business analysts? <laughs> um, it's all about measurement and growing, okay? Sharing, sharing is the look back, okay? Sharing is the feedback in the whole thing. Creating a culture where people can share ideas and problems is, is very key to what we're trying to achieve. Another in interest in motivation in DevOps movement is the way sharing DevOps success stories helps others. Okay. People, I, I was speaking to uh, Wojciech earlier, and he was like, oh, I, I heard some of the stuff that you were telling me that you do at OpenTable. It sounds really cool. Okay. When you tell people interesting stories of, and show them how things happen, they immediately get a little bit more interested in how to make their, their own environments better. It's just what happens. We're all competitive. It's a human factor. When we see somebody doing something really well, we want to do it well. We want to do it better. It's just the way it happens. It attracts talent. We can actually hire better people because we have got very good processes in place. Hands up who would happily go to an environment that is burning down, got legacy code, technical debt, and it takes months and months to deploy a system. Nobody. They're, uh, sorry? Depends on the money. In interesting, interesting. Short term view there. But, <laughs> but in actual seriousness, because when you go to an environment that, is, that, that has this type of culture, it makes it fun to work there. If you can deploy your code 20 minutes after you've written it in order to test it out, you think, God, that's really good. And not only that, if you can actually say that 15 minutes worth of code, it's ROI to the business is $10,000, then you'll start to think, oh, now we're starting to get interested. Okay, so you would never go somewhere unless for the money motivations. You would never really go somewhere that's just basically holding stale and not doing anything. It's just not what we would do. We would not be happy in that type of environment. Metrics and automation are key, as I've said. Okay? And I just wanted to show you some of the systems that we have at OpenTable. Really simple systems, nothing, you know, it's all um, open source systems that we use in order to actually gain some metrics. Da, da, da. So the first one is graphite. Sorry, I need to just connect to my VPN. So we run a, a, a decent size Elasticsearch cluster, okay? But what we actually want to do is we use Redis as a queuing mechanism uh, up until yesterday, actually. And we want to measure that if there are any problems in our system where Redis has taken a long time to clear its queue. So we found this last night and I just wanted to show you how we actually found that we had a real production problem yesterday. So if I go back to the last two days, it'll take a second to load, okay? Now you start to see spikes, it's still loading. I'm VPN through my phone, which is tethered to 3G, then going into San Francisco. So it's going to be slightly slow. <laughs> so you can see that we had a real spike right there. Okay. Now the normal graph, it doesn't really show anything too much. It just shows that there's a couple of 20, 30,000. This point we got to 647,000 messages in the queue on one server. Hmm, alarm bells were going. Not only that, if it lets me scroll. Oh. We don't want to do that. I've just broken the machine. What have I done? What have I done? Help. <laughs> um, I actually don't know what I've done. I did patch bash, actually. Who has tried to hack me? Turn it off and turn it on. 
Spot the Windows user. <laughs> um, it actually doesn't want to reconnect. This happened in Rob's session as well. It just went off. Oh, my laptop's not frozen. I can see pretty graphs in the screen. <laughs> um, does anybody have any thoughts? I think it's this. No, it's, it's working here. It's, oh, there we go. Yay. Yay. OK, so let's go back. Um, we can see at some point yesterday, why is it not working? There we go. At one point yesterday, we actually got to over 10 million logs stuck in our metric system. Okay, we had no idea what that problem was, and we, it actually gave us an indication that we needed to go and have a look. I actually got to 11 million last night. I went out for dinner and for beers and just left everyone else to fix it. But we actually still have the measurements and metrics in place in order to show how many metrics, uh, how, how many things are stuck in our system. Okay, and we can go back and we, we maxed out the RAM on one of our Redis servers because it was happening. And by taking this graph and placing it across the top of the graph that measures the data transfer between our data centers, we were actually able to see that we maxed out the CPU on a router. Okay, that would not be the first thing I would try and check if, if we had a, a blockage in our system, that a router was down. Okay, so it's important to have these metrics in place. Another one is Elasticsearch. Okay, again, we have a, a large login cluster, and we want to make sure that we understand um, the indexing per second. Okay, how many, how many logs are actually being indexed by Elasticsearch every single second, and make sure that there's no real nasty trends. And we can see that because we have the measurement in place, and we can see search rate, and we can see CPU, and so on and so forth, we understand these graphs, and we can understand where problems occur in the system. Okay. Now, this is using a metric system called Graphite. Okay, Graphite is a really simple system. If you're running Linux, you can actually just deploy a package called CollectD and start pointing it at a Graphite server, and Graphite will start to collect it. It's very, it's very simple. It's very easy to use. Okay. We have also got mechanisms. This is a QA. I can't show you our prod data for this because it shows total number of requests and so on and so forth and errors on our website. We don't want to show that we have any errors on our website. So this is actually in our QA system. Okay? This is in the past hour. This is for one team. This is a single team's dashboard. And that team looks after four APIs. Okay? And in an hour, they've taken 13,904 um, requests and have actually only, only thrown six non-200s. Okay? It's pretty good. They're, they're, they're pushing data through. Because they have this exact same dashboard in production, they understand where the trends lie. They understand what the metrics mean. Okay? They can understand the total requests, the average response times, the non-200s, user agents, average load, and then they can actually start to go in by request by URI. Okay? They understand if anything adverse is going on in their system at any point. Now, it's not just this team. We have got other teams doing exactly the same stuff that do all sorts of things like syslogs, puppet master logs, legacy API, um, data sync agents, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I think when I when I counted this uh, on our production system, we have in the region of about uh, 400 or 500 dashboards. Okay, now we're about three four months into our transition into Graphite. It's still classed as a beta inside our company because we're currently trying to work out our production infrastructure to put all metrics in there by default. So I'm trying to show you that it's about capturing as many metrics as you possibly can. If you capture the metrics, it means that you can learn what's happening and you can improve based off them. It's important to note, these are the summaries, right? It's important to note that we're all part of the same team. Development, operations, marketing, finance, business analysts, everybody. If we do not perform as a team together, our company is not successful. Okay. We need empathy between the teams. You can't hate your operations team. Your operations team cannot, well, they can hate marketing. That's a general, you are allowed to hate marketing. But by being part of the same team, we can achieve better things. Okay. When we're part of the same team, we can start to call ourselves a, high, uh, a highly efficient IT organization. So in 2013, uh, a survey of approximately 9,000 people 
okay, 9,700 or something, uh, was take, undertaken by Puppet Labs, ThoughtWorks, and, uh, and a website called IT Revolution, okay, in March last year. So companies who class themselves as starting to adopt a DevOps style actually said, uh, it ended up giving the following results, okay? High-performing IT teams are more agile, okay? They can deliver code 30 times faster and fit with 50% less failures. Okay, these are actually measured, okay, so the, 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 the survey basically said before you believe that you adopted Agile uh, or um, DevOps practices, you were releasing code every X months, and since you have adopted these practices in the culture, you are now releasing every Y amount of time. So they measured it, and on, on average, it can be as much as 30 times faster, okay. The lead time for, for changes Okay, and this is what's fascinating for the actual business itself. The lead time for ideas to production can be as much as 8,000 times faster. Okay, in some cases it was taking a year for a feature to go through the system and because they were a high performing agile team and committing code much faster, they were getting features to try on their website with experimenting in less than half a day, half an hour, 30 minutes, whatever. Okay? Because if you have these automation tools and these uh, pipelines and, and the fabric of, of automation together, at that point you can release your code really quickly. Okay. High performing IT teams can recover faster. I asked you the question already. Okay. My favorite example of this is Netflix. There was a huge EC2 outage 2009, I want to say. One of the only companies that practically survived that in, in any way intact over the course of the few days was Netflix. Because Netflix, have, they, they have a tool already in their system called Chaos Monkey, which they deploy by randomly and it simulates all sorts of outages. It takes servers offline. They have another one called Chaos Gorilla and another one called Chaos Kong. They, they can simulate entire AC2 availability zone outages and what effect that has on their system. Recoveries can happen up to 12 times faster when you adopt these practices and these ways of thinking. High performing IT teams can experiment more. 37% less time apparently was spent firefighting. That's 37% more time for experimentation. Operating system upgrades, new languages, being able to react faster to changes. Ultimately, this means better products for your customers. Okay, whether your customer is an end user of your application or an internal user of your system, if you are able to react and create better systems, then they will be much happier and you'll actually, you'll actually be very harmonious. There's a concept around the DevOps culture called situational awareness. Okay? And situational awareness is the ability to identify, process, and comprehend the critical elements of information about what's happening to the teams. Okay, this was actually a, an answer given by the US Coast Guard. But we can simply know it as knowing what is going on around us. We can't know what's going on around us unless we have the metrics, unless we have the culture, unless we have the automation fabric. We need all of these pieces of the puzzle and then we can actually react to the system. Okay? DevOps for the win. It does actually change the way that you look at software. It really does. Like People say because I'm now DevOps, I'm a sysadmin. I've actually started writing better code now. I don't really write any end user code, but I actually have written better systems since understanding more about operations than I ever did before. I would actually step back now and think of what happens upstream and downstream and see the effects and how I monitor systems and how I alert based off them. And I actually create less error prone code. That's hard to believe because I don't write a lot of code, but I actually, the code that I write seems to stand up better. It actually does. So there are some very important people that we should follow if you're very interested in this area. Patrick Dubois, John Allspaw, John Willis, Damon Edwards, Gene Kim, Dan North, Jez Humble. Okay, these are all guys who are real, really up there and really actually tweet about this and this culture movement as they go forward. If ever you get a chance to sit, well obviously Dan done the keynote this morning, but if you ever get a chance to see some of the other guys talk, take it because they're all very, very, very good speakers. Thanks to the lovely folks at DigitalOcean, okay, there is actually a promo code for, Di uh, for DigitalOcean which will give you $150 of free credit. It's good for 24 hours. 
go and try some of these concepts. Try some of these open source tools. Go and install Logstash and Elasticsearch and Kibana. Start pushing some data through it. Start analyzing what you can do. Install Graphite. Go off and put Jenkins as a continuous integration server, etc. Okay? Go and try it out. It's $150 of free credit. You can't not take it. Okay? Has, I've got five minutes? Excellent. Does anybody have any questions? Graphite on Windows? Uh, graphite does. Uh, so run your Graphite server on Linux, but you can collect metrics from Windows as well. Has everybody got a picture of the, the promo code? Excellent. It's gone. Um, let me see if I can show you. Uh, GitHub, OpenTable, <coughs> Puppet modules. So this is our actual Puppet repo. Okay, it's got like 8,000 commits, something like that. But we have what's called Graphite PowerShell. So it's a little PowerShell module that gets deployed to the application. It runs as a service and it picks up any metrics that you give it. So not only can it pick up system metrics, like CPU and load, but it can also pick up application metrics like uh, the W3C process time, the garbage collection for the CLR, et cetera, et cetera. So any performance counters you can actually pick up. So you basically create, I'm trying to see if I can show you an example. Oh yeah, I can actually. It might be a little dark. Come on. Come and grab me at the end and I'll show you it, okay? Okay. Any other questions? Uh, so Graphite is the server. Uh, it's made up of a few components. Um, the packages that you would send data to it is a shell script or a, a PowerShell script from Windows and a package called CollectD uh, from Linux and you just wire them in, install them and then it, it, it'll automatically grab any metrics that you tell it to grab and it'll forward it onto the server. Excuse me? There's a... Oh, the, the UI, um, that's, that comes with it. That comes built in. You can change that. That's a project as well called Grafana. Okay, G-R-A-F-A-N-A. Any others? We know. <laughs> we have a mixture of Puppet and Chef. Um, I honestly don't know why that's the case. It, that there is a team that are extremely um, pr productive with their Chef systems and they, they use Knife EC2. And I'm happy that that's the case. There's no problem. We have about, in total, config managed, we have about 1,800 servers now, and that's within a year. So which we think is about 70% of our production infrastructure, uh, but we're, we're trying to improve that every single day. We're trying to tear down old systems and re recreate them, uh, bringing them back up. Any other questions? The same matters uh, how small you are, is there a limit, or it doesn't matter? Doesn't matter. How many servers have you got in your company? I don't know. Even if it's one, it doesn't matter. If you can guarantee that your, app, that your environment is the same in QA as it is in production, and that you deploy code in exactly the same way every single time, then you're going to be much more successful that way. Start small. That's all I can say. Start with one application. Try and put the automation framework in place, and if it works for you, add more in. Okay? Metric systems and logging systems are probably the most important to start with, though. Any others? I like it. I'm not very good with Vim. <laughs> so, <laughs> look, look at his face. Look at the scorn. Huh? Why what? I don't know. <laughs> Why not? It's shiny. It's new. <laughs> I like it. Uh, are you using or planning to use Docker? In we do use Docker. We actually use um, a, a system called Mesos, uh, which is 
another way of being able to maintain virtualiza part, um, virtualization systems. We are big, big fans of that, and a lot of our systems are moving that way. So, like for example, we have a mixture of Team City and uh, Jenkins, and even our build agents spin up Docker instances so that we can test different things inside the environments. Any last question? No. Excellent, guys. Thanks all so much for your time. Uh, let's go and enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Thank you.